Hello. Today, we are here to rank all the Walking Dead volumes. And I guess without further ado, let's not waste any more time and jump right into this. So just like with uh, with the TV, ver uh, TV version ranking, right? I have all of them listed out somewhere up there. Uh, they have little numbers next to them because obviously, especially on stream, I'm guessing you can barely see anything. All right, without further ado, volume one. Uh, let me bring up the wiki right away. Uh, volume one, uh, this covers, of course, the first six issues. It basically sets up the entire story, right? Um, frankly, here, because this is uh, like the very, very beginning, and uh, this is where all the Shane stuff happens. And again, it is basically responsible for getting The Walking Dead off the ground. Um, with the comic book more than uh, more so than with the TV version, and I know Kirkman would disagree with this probably, I think with the comic book, it already starts off incredibly strong, right? With the TV version, it had, uh, it had its growing pains. I mean, that's what happens, right? Uh, you kind of have to find your groove, first of all. But with the comic book, because it has a lot less creative restrictions, frankly, I think Days Gone By is easy S-tier. Just like right out of the gate, it sets up so, so much. And it does it so well. Uh, killing off main characters, like, right from the get-go, that is something that didn't really happen in these sorts of stories, right? Especially with Carl being the one to shoot Shane, which is, of course, again, a massive remix from... Uh, from the TV version. And now that they are also coming out in the colored versions, by the way, unless uh, many of you have probably not read the books. So if you do pick them up, I recommend checking out the deluxe version. Um, the colored panels are absolutely beautiful. Uh, obviously, the black and white edition was perfectly fine. But with the colored ones, all of that early Walking Dead is just so, so good. So yeah, volume one, absolutely easy S tier. It has a lot of iconic moments, and it basically, it sets everything up. I mean, there's really not, not, it's a low, low tier for me. We're already getting some, uh, some, uh, disagreement in the chat. I think it is easy S tier. And it, mostly I think it's easy S tier because of how snappy it is, right? I do see how many people think, um, that the early comic book is, like, way too snappy, right? And I think that's also why season one expanded the story, uh, in that sense. Because um, the comic book is basically go, go, go. It did what it had to do, in my mind, at least. All right. Moving on. Volume 2. Miles Behind Us. So, this is another volume that is absolutely jam-packed. Uh, even more so than with Season 1, right? Or the first volume. Because this volume covers a ridiculous amount of ground. So, this goes from Wiltshire Estates right into Herschel's farm, right through to Herschel's farm, and basically wraps up all that. So it covers a lot. And on top of that, it has snow. Now, if you have seen any of my content, either on One Piece or on The Walking Dead or anywhere else for that matter, anything that has snow is a win in my book. So on that basis alone, this gets a lot of stuff. This gets like a lot of credit. Uh, this is when Carl gets shot, which again, was a big surprise for I think everybody involved. It came out of the blue, basically. Uh, especially because again, it is Rick's son, right? It's it's one of the characters that, that should have the thickest plot armor of all time, but he didn't. Uh, but in terms of the story, the farm... The farm was your early apocalypse stuff, right? So, it's like... A few, a few people that are not exactly accustomed to the way of things. And it's not really that high stakes. So, basically what carries this volume for me is the setting and everything else of that nature. Uh, I like the stuff with Alan uh, after Donna's gruesome death. Uh, that That is pretty good, yeah. That is pretty good. Because this is where all of that starts, right? At Wiltshire. Honestly, I think this... I think volume 2 is like... It's like a... B. I think it's a B. I don't think it's quite an A. It might even be a C. I should have probably added another tier because there's going to be a lot of these, but whatever. Um, it's going to be a B for me. It's a solid volume. It has snow, but in terms of, in terms of like the the nuances and all that, like 
the entire Wiltshire or Shire Wilt or whatever it was. I think it was Wiltshire. Uh, whatever it was. It's basically a in and out type of deal, right? We don't really do anything there. So it doesn't really amount to much. Moving on to volume 3, Safety Behind Bars. For context, this is issue 13, right? Where this volume starts. And this is where this is where the big transition happened in the show, right? Because we went through season 2 at a ridiculously slow pace. And then we got into this volume and everything went haywire. And the thing is, the comic book, in many cases, which is super weird. The comic book in this part of the story is slower than the TV version. Which is something kind of unheard of, to be honest. Because, uh, like, the TV version doesn't really add that much. It adapts just the comic events and does it incredibly fast. This is a really strong part of the story, right? And again, recently reading it in full color sort of reignited my love for it, right? And this is where all the all the dark turns of the prisoners happen, right? Uh, it, it is a really, really brutal volume. Uh, I'd go as far as to say that even now, even after Negan, even after The Whispers, this volume is still among among the most messed up in terms of just, like, sheer brutality. And because of that, it really nails the whole dark vibe of the prison. And I love it. And I love it. Now, one thing I need to check. So this is also where Rick's first sort of rampage happens, right? Because that happened in issue 17. I have my uh, Walking Dead retrospective folder up on my uh, other monitor too. I'm just looking through the chapters as I speak. So this is where Rick's first rampage happened. And again, in the, in the version that is done in full color, I mentioned this in the retrospective too. They did the whole thing as Rick, uh, Rick goes more and more berserk. Uh, like the entire panel becomes more and more red. Uh, that's such a nice touch. I love this volume. This is basically where all the where all the shenanigans take place. This is where they find the heads. Uh, this is where Andrea is attacked. This is where all that happens, yeah. Also, one thing that the show uh, obviously couldn't do, right? Because the story was different. This was when Rick returned to Shane's grave, right? And put him down. Because keep in mind that in the in the book, he was shot in the neck, so he turned. Uh, so Rick returned after they figured uh, figured themselves out, of course, that the walkers turn. Or rather, people turn. I've been talking about it so much. How can I not rank it S at this point? I think I have to rank it S. I love this chapter. Uh, not this chapter, this volume. I'm, I'm gonna do it S. I I'm doing S. This is, I think, when The Walking Dead really found its footing, in both versions, frankly. Moving on to Volume 4, The Heart's Desire. So, this one is a bit less action-y, I suppose is the word. Um, there is a little bit of it, right? Because this is where, like, Michonne is introduced, and this is also where um, some of the other prisoners go wild. Uh, and this is where the whole... basically where Rick starts killing people properly. Because uh, that is issue 19, I think. Oh, and this is also where uh, where they do the whole leg thing. Right. Right. Okay, you know what? Are we going to have back-to-back -back S tier? I'm looking through the numbers. Yeah. Oh, boy. I th oh, this is where the We Are the Walking Dead thing uh, happens, too. This is uh, issue 24, where Rick announces that they are the Walking Dead. Like, from that alone. Oh, boy. This tier list is going to be much harder than the, uh, the the TV version, I think. This is a solid, solid volume. And this is also where the Tyrese versus Rick fight happens. Is this is this just me loving the prison arc? And this is why I want to put everything in the prison at S tier? That might be it, honestly. That might be it. You know what? You know what? Why not? This is my tier list, right? I can put it S tier. Uh, that said... Yeah, I think the order is fine. I don't think it's better than uh, than the third one. Uh, the comics are usually consistently great. Well, that's the thing. I want to have... This is what I try to do with the TV version as well. Uh, I want to have a sort of a normal distribution, right? Uh, I kind of failed in doing that because I forgot about it. But um, I want to distinguish them even by the tiniest margin if I can. But honestly, I think toward the end, it's going to happen naturally because I'll say it right now. I'm not a huge fan of the final volumes. 
Because I feel like they are extremely rushed. Like, they are ridiculously rushed. We'll get to it. We'll get to it. Moving on to Volume 5. The Best Defense. So this is the Governor's introduction. And this is also, of course, where Rick loses his hand. Which is an absolutely incredible moment that I am still sad we never got to see adapted. Oh no, this is... Oh, I've made a mistake. I've... I've made a big mistake. I want to put this S tier as well. But at this point, it's getting funny. I feel like I'm going to put everything S tier. Th this is another incredible volume. Because this has so much stuff, right? This has the entire introduction to the governor. This is where we see his uh, collection of heads. And this is also where the whole fake out happens, where they return to the prison and we think the governor is actually attacked, but he obviously hasn't. Um, I think Rick losing his hand was cool, but I think it happened way too soon. Um, uh, I feel like you're not the only one who thinks about the whole hand thing. Because, I mean, even Kirkman has said that he has gone back and forth on the, uh, Rick hand thing, right? Because it just causes a lot of problems. Is there- is there something I don't like about this volume? Let's think about it like that. Maybe that- maybe the helicopter crashing thing is a little bit weird, right? Because it never really has any- any through line, as it did in the show. Maybe that. And what about the, we feed them strangers? That is such an incredible moment. We're putting it S tier. We're putting it S tier. And you know what, frankly, I think this one is better. Uh, I think this one is better than 4. <laughs> it was so much easier with the TV version, because they're like... I feel like with the TV version, because it tackles, like, complete arcs, when you, like, have a great arc, all of it is just in a single thing. Uh, but with the comic book, it's sort of... It's much harder to distinguish, right? Because the governor arc, I love the governor arc. Uh, and everything about it was brilliant. So now that I have this, it's sorta, sorta yikes. But okay, volume six, This Sorrowful Life. If memory serves me right, let me run through the, through the things. I think this chapter, uh, not chapter. I, can't, I keep saying chapters because I'm used to the uh, One Piece reading streams now. Uh, this volume, I think is a bit slower. Rightfully so. So, the two highlights in this one is basically Michonne and the governor, right? All the fun stuff she does there. Um, I mean, we all know what she does, right? Uh, she uses a whole bunch of uh, home appliances to um, modify the governor. And the other highlight here is, of course, the Martinez uh, death. Well, uh, Rick chasing him down. But aside from that, this volume is pretty whatever. In terms of events, uh, I do think it is more exciting than than 2, definitely. But does it... Is it a, uh, is it a tier, though? You know what? I'm gonna leave it at B. I'll leave it, for, I'll leave it at B for now. Maybe I'll move it up. Then moving on to Volume 7, The Calm Before. So these are issues 37 through 42. Basically, this is... The chill part, right? This is where nothing really happens at the prison. This was basically the time skip of sorts in the in the TV version. And for that, uh, I mean, in the story, it was a big deal, right? Because the prison was basically a safe haven for our characters. So from that perspective, it was incredibly important. From a reader's perspective, though, not much really happens. Where do I put it because of that? Okay, so the only problem with my statement is that this volume stretches into 42. Because the governor begins his initial attack at 42. So we see the tank at, the, uh, at 42. Uh, does Carol die in this volume? She does, yes. Uh, that happens basically at the tail end. Carol's death in this chapter is basically like the um, one of the few big things that happens. I mean, Dale also gets bitten on the leg. Which is pretty big. I feel like I'm gonna put it C tier for now. Because it's mostly set up. It mostly sets everything up. So, following this, we move on to another absolutely packed one. Made to Suffer. Uh, this volume is gnarly. Uh, it covers issues 43 to 48. And it is basically the majority of the Governor War. Right? So... I mean, this issue opens with Rick getting shot. That is just ridiculous. I mean, it doesn't literally open with Rick getting shot, right? Because we see the whole... We see the flashback first. But this volume, it just opens up with something 
ridiculous right off the bat. We see a tank roll up to the to the walls. Obviously, it doesn't really do anything, right? Unlike the TV version where it was actually firing things. But still, it rolls up. The governor just starts making his commands. They do retreat fairly quickly, but Rick is shot, which is massive. Um, of course, this was split into two parts for the TV version, which was kind of unfortunate, but it is what it is. And then, of course, we get into Governor's proper attack, which, again, happens basically right away. Uh, the death of Lori and Judith. Yes, yes. Those are still... I, like, I am not surprised at all that they weren't adapted. There are rumors. Uh, I don't want to say anything, but there are rumors. If you know, you know. If you know, you know. But there are rumors, and I don't know how to feel about those rumors. Frankly, this volume, this volume, I think, is basically what defines the level of the level of sheer brutality and the villains we'd see. And because of that, do I put it S tier? Because the governor's attack is just... I mean, nobody's gonna forget the governor's attack, right? Even if the tank wasn't actually firing. I think the attack is ridiculous. Especially like him getting getting the katana and slicing off Tyrese's head. Everything about it was ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah, the, the Judith remix in the TV version is one that can easily catch you off guard. Because in the comic book, like, as brutal as it sounds, she's really not a around for that long, right? But yeah, for now, I think the old Guvna is sitting at S tier. Alright, moving on to Volume 9, Here We Remain. So, this is another volume that is basically a follow-up, right? Rightfully so, it is quite a bit slower. I don't think that surprises anyone. Following the Governor's Massacre and all that, clearly the characters need some breathing room. Uh, this is basically the volume where... I mean, Carl has already gotten quite a bit of spotlight in the book, right? I mean, I mean he got a quite a bit of spotlight in Issue 6. Uh, with Shane. But here we basically see him walk around on his own, uh, get up to his own little troubles and all that. And this is also where Rick begins his whole phone conversations with Lori, uh, which is, I think, done better in the comic book, frankly. Because uh, in the TV version, it showed up, Rick kind of went crazy for a little while. I don't even know how to describe it. He was just a little bit all over the place, whereas in the in the book, it was just this this depressing, and like, I think he kn he knew full well a lot of the time that what he was doing was basically just trying to cope with it, right? Whereas in the show, it was just, it was just more intense, I guess, how I would describe it. So I think that that coping process was done better. Uh, and this is also the volume where Abraham's introduced. But with that said, this is a much slower volume. I think it's B tier, honestly. I think it's like, do I put it above volume 2 or not? Uh, Ghost Lori was weird to me. Yeah, I mean, a lot of the stuff, I feel like they... The whole Rick, Rick hallucinations thing in the prison, it was just... I, uh, I think what kind of sums up the entire thing was that a lot of people were confused about the, the f whole phone situation to begin with, right? In the comic book, it was made perfectly clear that Rick is imagining the whole thing. But in the TV version, I genuinely had friends and stuff ask me, like, who was that? Who was calling him? How was Rick talking to someone? And then many people even started calling it a plot hole. Because apparently the people on the phone disappeared and the plot line was dropped, right? Uh, the introduction to the idea of hordes came with Abraham. Indeed. Uh, this is the first ever proper, um, how would you call it? Uh, I don't know, I guess it is just introduction, right? Introduction of hordes. So Abraham is the first ever person to explain the concept of hordes. Which was super exciting. Honestly, because Rick went into Atlanta, right, and he saw the horde, it wouldn't have really worked in the TV version uh, if they tried to pull something like that. But the whole name drop of, of hordes being a thing, it was super exciting. So yeah, it's difficult. It's difficult, I guess, to really adapt that. Because clearly they wanted to build up hype with season 1. And to build up hype with a zombie show, need a lot of zombies. You know what? I'm gonna move it up. I'm gonna move it up to to the second spot. 
Uh, I think it is a little bit stronger than the uh, than the second volume. Uh, honestly, I'm looking over these rankings and I'm already starting to doubt myself, but it's fine. We'll power through. We'll power through. We're almost a third of the way through. Can you imagine that? And it's almost been an hour. Great. Volume 10. What we become. If memory serves me right, 55 to 60 is another one that is pretty gnarly. Because I think this is, this is where the Carl incident happens, right? So yeah, so this is where Maggie tries to, you know... Again, there are guidelines that are of things I can and can't say, but if you've read the book, you know. This is also where we see a lot of tension between Rick and Abraham flare up, which was uh, basically, they kind of, in a weird way, I feel like they remixed Abraham's role for Shane's role super early on. Because in the, in the comic book... We never really saw Rick sort of contested for his leadership that much. There was that minor, minor plotline in the prison, but frankly, it was never really that pronounced. Isn't the Carl thing at the start of Volume Eleven? Uh, yes, yes, you're right. Yes, you're right. This is th this is still a packed volume though, because this is the volume where the uh, the scavengers appear, or are these not the scavengers? Whoever they are, basically the the, the group of dudes on the street, right? That Rick bites their throat out. So in that sense, this this volume is still very, very gnarly. And this is also where they go to pick up Morgan, right? Uh, honestly, I think for the highway sequence alone, and with how important that was, I think this deserves at least an A. I'm gonna move four down and put 10 in S. Because that sequence is absolutely legendary. I'm, I'm thinking now, maybe put it even, put it even higher. And Morgan feeding zombie Dwayne? Morgan is a character that, unfortunately, I do not like in the comic version. I think Morgan in the TV version is magnitudes better. Up until he was pushed over to fear, that is. The comic Morgan doesn't really do anything, if that makes sense. He's sort of there, and yeah, there is the scene with him and Carl, which was kind of important. But aside from that, I'm not a huge fan, honestly. He doesn't really do much. And then he just dies. So, it might just be the case of uh, Letty James being being an absolute legend, uh, to be fair. Because again, I, I feel like Lenny James is one of those actors that just took the, uh, took the character that was given to him and massively elevated it just because he's, again, an absolute legend. It, basically, the Steven Yeun situation, right? I'm gonna leave it here for now. Frankly, I want to move it up because this is also where we see the massive horde, which was incredibly hype. Like the whole getaway sequence with Abraham, that was absolutely awesome. You know what? I'm gonna move it up. No, it's fine. We'll, we'll leave it like that. We'll leave it like that. We'll leave it like that. Moving on to volume 11, Fear the Hunters. Um, I think I've made it pretty clear. I absolutely love this volume. And frankly, seeing the TV version made me dislike this volume. Basically because the TV version is better in my opinion. I'm gonna put it, I'm just gonna put it like at A, right? It is an incredibly strong volume. I absolutely love the premise of it. The premise of it alone, like the whole cannibals thing, I mean, that that is classic zombie apocalypse. That is classic apocalypse uh, to begin with. And then with how brutal it is, oh boy. And this is also where the twins thing to, uh, takes place, which is again, honestly, I feel like Fear the Hunters, uh, the volume is is ridiculous. But the, the show adaptation, yeah, you're already saying it in chat. Uh, I feel like the show adaptation blew the, the comic book out of the park in certain cases. Um, like I said in the in the retrospective, right? I still love the volume, but man, the church sequence in the show, sheesh. And the remix with Terminus, oh boy, oh boy. An absolutely incredible remix, uh, I'll say that. And the fact that like in the book, they are around for how many issues? I think they're around for like six or seven issues. Uh, six or seven issues like max, right? Let me check. Yeah, issue 65 is already... 65, 66. So it's basically like right at the end of the volume, yeah. Rick basically says, we're just gonna burn them and stuff. They twisted that into an entire like sub arc in the show, which I absolutely loved. So an incredibly strong volume, that's for sure. Volume 12, 
Life Among Them, 67 through 72. This is another one that is a bit more low-key, right? So this is basically where they, uh, where they discover that Eugene is not a scientist. And this is where Aaron already pops up. This was a huge deal for the comic book. Um, because again, Kirkman initially planned it to be the end of the series, which is, I think, still ridiculous. Uh, apparently reaching Alexandria was the original endpoint. Then No Way Out was another endpoint. And then obviously, we all know what happened. In terms of reaching Alexandria, though, this is a bit of a hot take, probably. Uh, aside from going into Washington for that brief detour, I think the the arrival at Alexandria was stronger in the in the TV version. Uh, again, I like the nighttime sequences, right? And the the nighttime sequences there were absolutely excellent. Uh, I think the Eugene revelation was done better in the show. Uh, I honestly couldn't tell you because the 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 Eugene surprise for me because I had read the books. In the TV version, it never really registered as a reveal. It was always at the back of my mind, right? So as soon as he appeared, I was like, okay, let's get to it. Obviously, this guy's talking nonsense. So it's kind of difficult for me to distinguish the two versions there. Uh, in terms of sheer events, though, this one is kind of light. This one is kind of light. It's mostly just traveling around and getting introduced to a bunch of characters. Uh, so on that basis alone... I don't know, like, th th does this fit into, like, 12, uh, just above 7? That's the thing. Like, w we talked about at the very, very start. I feel like the comic book is continuously, continuously very good, right? Because when it's not doing intense things, it is important setup, which is also very good. Whereas with the TV version, obviously, there's the problem of filler and all that. I'll put it there for now. We'll see how it ends up. We'll see how it ends up. Uh, volume 13, Too Far Gone. Uh, this is a pretty big one, if I recall right. So this is basically them getting accustomed to, to Alexandria, and all the survivors are basically Giga Chads, right? So they rise through the ranks, and they basically tell everyone, Hey, I'm an absolute legend. There's the whole Abraham thing. He joins the construction crew. A day later, he is the, the boss of the construction crew. So this is the volume where Rick goes a little bit... A little bit overboard and uh, pulls the gun on the community, right? And basically tells them that, hey, listen to me, you don't know how to live and you're all gonna die. And again, that is an incredibly legendary moment. And I feel like the adaptation nailed it. And this is also the same volume where the, um, where they have the meeting, right? And then Rick shows up and just shoots, uh, shoots the, uh, shoots the dude. All of that happens in the space of the single volume. This is a very, very, very packed volume, all things considered. Especially because it is moments after Rick arrives, basically. It's definitely stronger than 12. It's definitely stronger than 2. Is it stronger than... I think it is. Did I put it, like, right there? Following this, we have No Way Out. And I know No Way Out is going to be incredible. This is another one of those instances where I would kind of have to bring up the whole, you know, adaptation thing. Because the way they adapted the Rick scene was just... Again, it was excellent. They adapted the comic material, basically one-to-one. -one, but because they did some some of those little changes with how the Paul Pete storyline is, uh, uh, is told, I feel like the emotional intensity in that entire thing was just even further pronounced. Maybe it's just the, the adaptation sort of coloring my opinion a little bit. But it is a very, very strong volume. No Way Out. Surprising nobody, No Way Out is obviously... A very, very, very strong volume. I think it is at least easy A tier. Uh, does it rank higher, though? Is yet to be seen. Let me look at the precise numbers. So this is 79 through to 84. No Way Out was done very, very good in both versions. Aside from the fact that the TV version split it into, split it into two episodes with the, uh, the mid-season break. Then there is Carl losing his eye, which is a much bigger deal in the comic book because it didn't literally skip over the entire thing as the, uh, as the show did. And the whole unity aspect of Alexandria, I feel like, I feel like it's super pronounced in the comic version. I think this one's shooting all the way up. I think this one might actually top Made to Suffer for me. It's got absolutely everything you would want from a, uh, from a zombie story. It's got a lot of zombies. It's got, like, survival struggles, because it was the winter time and they were already low on food. It's got inner drama, because the whole 
Rick leadership thing was still not sorted out. He's got it all. He's got it all. And I mean, again, there's a reason why Kirkman thought about ending the story here, right? This is another point where the story was supposed to end with Rick making his proclamation that uh, they would save Alexandria. And that would become a statue. That was the original ending. Exactly. And it also sets up uh, the big, big sort of collapse that would follow with Negan, right? We get into that pretty soon. So in this, it basically, I think I said this in the retrospective, right? But I would liken it to a, a final boss of sorts, right? So leading up to No Way Out, the zombies were always the biggest thing. There was the governor, there were like the hunters in between. But broadly speaking, the zombies were always a problem, right? They were always a problem that were hard to manage. And even people would get wiped out by walkers. But after No Way Out, it feels like we have mastered them, right? We have these walls, even when they broke them down, we still survived, we cleared the community out, and we will rebuild. So in that sense, it sort of, it transitions into the, into the next part of The Walking Dead. So it's basically a climax, is what I'm saying, for the first part of the story. Yeah, I'm leaving, I'm leaving it at top, top S tier. I'm leaving it at top S tier. Because Negan coming in would basically, like, absolutely make this entire thing collapse, which is just brilliant. Volume 15, We Find Ourselves. So We Find Ourselves is basically a direct follow-up that we never got in the show. This one is basically all about Carl's recovery, all about Rick's recovery, because, I mean, his son just got shot in the face, right? That's a pretty big deal. And he also just lost someone close to him. It's, it's messed up, right? Rick is not doing particularly well either. And we also see the whole struggle of of him trying to get close to people and then trying to lead this new community. It's basically an emotional journey, is how I would call it. There's also the rebellion mounting within Alexandria of people who don't exactly like Rick. Uh, so there's also that drama angle. It's a really, really strong volume in terms of human stories, right? This one is fairly light on external threats uh, or zombie threats or everything else of that nature. This one is basically all about, all about the survivors. This is a really, really good volume. But it's kind of hard to rate because it's a follow-up, right? It's basically not the calm before, it's the morning after. And one of those scenes that I still think, like Rick talking to Andrea and saying that he's lost his little boy, is one of the like most brutal things ever, right? That's, that's really, really, really dark. I'm gonna put it, I think it deserves, despite it not being like super hype, I think it deserves A tier. Just because of how personal the stories are. I'm gonna leave it at A for now. Uh, I like the story with Nicholas in this uh, in this volume. Yeah, the whole the whole inner rebellion is also also a strong point in this one. But to me, that is more so a B plot, basically. For me, the biggest thing is is everything surrounding Carl in this one. Volume 16, A Larger World. So this is basically the narrative through line here, is right, we mastered the zombies, we build up our community so that zombies are never a problem. And then, oh wait, there's more, right? That's basically what I think Kirkman was thinking. Because a larger world, basically, it does what it says on the tin. It is a larger world, right? Everything about the story we knew so far changes in an instant. Suddenly, there are more communities, there are more people, there are more threats. Everything is just worse, I guess. Obviously, we don't yet get into the uh, into the Savior Saga as as soon as we do with the uh, with the adaptation, but still, meeting Jesus was absolutely awesome. Uh, getting into the hilltop was another awesome moment, and I mean, again, the hilltop in the comic book, right? It is an absolutely spectacular community compared to the TV version. Uh, seeing the hilltop for the first time in the book was absolutely mind-boggling. It was basically the same thing as getting into Alexandria and you see all these pristine houses. But when we got to the hilltop, it wasn't pristine houses. It was genuinely people who had made this, made basically a settlement, right? That was incredible. So with that said, a larger world is mostly a setup type of deal, right? It doesn't do much. The, the big thing here, I'm actually beginning to notice a trend, right? Because again, uh, I consume The Walking Dead through, it, uh, through the issues. So I never really follow the, the volume trends. But um, I'm starting to notice the trend that a volume opens up with some setup. And then always in like the last issues of the, of the volume, Kirkman added something to spice it up, right? So this is where Rick's what takes place. 
there's always a hook at the end. I mean, it makes perfect sense. I'm leaning towards A tier too, but I'm wondering, I'm wondering like what's gonna come next in A tier. I think for the world building alone, it's at least B tier. And then for the events, I think I can justify a low A. A low A, but an A. Something to fear. I'm just gonna do that before I say anything. Yeah, volume 17. Do I need to say anything at all? Like, there's a reason why issue 100 is in the middle of this volume. It breaks everything. The entire story leading up to this point is almost like we were building up these dominoes and then Negan comes in and just smashes everything down. Everything changes in this volume. Absolutely everything we believed, we thought we were safe, no we were not. Negan comes in, changes everything, instantly. There really is nothing to say. Honestly, for me, volume 17 is a perfect volume. In the bigger story, it achieves so, so much, especially after No Way Out. I'm not gonna keep repeating it 50 times, but it basically crumbles down everything. And that's what it's supposed to do. And Negan in the comic book, I think I've made it pretty clear by now. Uh, volume 17 and Negan are better in the comic book by basically any stretch. The only things I feel like the adaptation did better was the build-up to the lineup in some in some case, uh, in some some ways. Um, because uh, again, the nighttime shoot, the whole whistling thing in the forest, they basically just leverage the medium to make the entire thing scarier. But in terms of Negan himself, I mean, I think I've made it pretty clear now. Uh, I like him dropping 16 F-bombs in rapid succession. It's funny. It's funny. It, the, the emotional dichotomy of Negan in every single scene he is in. You just don't know who this guy is. The dude's a literal jester, and I love that. Very much needed comic relief. That's the thing with Negan. Because he's not really co uh, comic relief, right? Comedic relief. He's supposed to be, but he's not. And I think that's what works so incredibly well with Negan in the book. They they do that a lot in the TV version as well. I mean, in like the last uh, video that went up, the whole sp uh, spaghetti scene, for example. I mean, that is top tier, right? The spaghetti scene in the show. Perfect. But compared to the comic book, we'll get to it, obviously, in the retrospectives too. Uh, Negan is just... There, there's a lot more flair to him, I'll say that. Volume 18. What comes after? I mean, can you name a volume something something better than what comes after? Because this is literally, like, our world was just shattered into a million pieces. What does come after, right? This is where Lil Army Man Carl goes into the sanctuary, right? Shoots down Negan's dudes. Negan's like, okay, 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 I'm gonna give you a tour. So then they take a tour of Willy Wonka's factory, and it's, and it's fun, it's fun. Then, of course, uh, the whole big surprise happens, and uh, Rick actually throws down with Negan, which is, again, insane. There's a lot that happens this volume. There's a lot that happens this- I'm just going through the- through the numbers again. And, oh boy, this volume is absolutely packed. You know what? You know what? You know what? I'm gonna put it- I'm gonna put it at least A. At least A. At least A in my book. It is- it is really, really, really good. You know what? I'm gonna put- I'm definitely gonna put Negan above the Hunters. As much as I love the Hunters, the follow-up with Negan is so much better. Let's leave it there. Then we have Volume 19, March to War. This is one that I've- I've obviously covered very, 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 very recently. Uh, I'm just working on it. I was editing today, by the way, in the next video. So it is very much fresh in my mind. Maybe because- maybe because I've been staring at it for the past, like, 40 hours of my life. Um, maybe that's why I want to bring it down, but to me, March to War is super exciting because of how fast it ramps up, right? It starts off relatively slow, but then it just goes haywire at the end, and that's what I love. Uh, did you feel like all that war section for the books was dragged out a little? For the books, definitely not. Like, in the books, it's- some say that it's too fast, honestly. All Out War in the books, like, especially here- I'm gonna rank this. I'm gonna rank this, then we're gonna talk about it a little bit more. March to War, like, ranking these volumes is so ridiculously hard. Like, it's- it, it makes zero sense at this point. I'm just doing it for the funsies. I'm gonna put it above 9. The thing with March to War and All Out War is, again, it ramps up incredibly fast. Like, we basically go from Negan's introduction, Rick fights Negan, 
then Negan like visits them a little bit later and all our war starts, right? Because there is so, so much fluff with, uh, with like recruiting people, with the guns being missing, then people being taken by Negan and all that. None of that happens in the book. In the book, it is literally just a straightforward thing of we realize Negan is bad. We need to rise up against Negan. Rick goes around, gets the communities, and we go. Like, it's just that easy. I'm going to talk about this in the upcoming video a lot, so don't worry about it. Yeah, and you bring up a very good point. During the during All Out War, uh, the comic book uh, issues were coming out faster than usual. Because usually the comic issues came out uh, monthly, right? But for, for All Out War, they came out every two weeks, I believe. It's it's still it's still a wait, right? But it's much faster. All Out War, I kind of want to rank them together, honestly, because All Out War being part one and two, I think there's a really good reason why it's part one and two, because Kirkman just had too much story, right? Part two is better than one. Yes, yes, definitely, one hundred percent, one hundred percent. The part part one of All Out War is kind of what you expect, right? They show up, they shoot a little bit. Then they fall back, right? And then part two is like the proper one. Uh, again, in the in the show, it was ridiculous. Uh, I, I <laughs> let me give you a little bit of behind the scenes. Um, I was working on today's video, right? Not today's video, but the one that will come out, the next Walking Dead one. And you know, there's the scene in season eight where they have like all the saviors lined up and all the survivors lined up where the guns jam, and the line of saviors there. I wanted to count the people, but I couldn't. There were too many. There were too many. Uh, and that is after the war. The numbers Negan has in the show, it's comedic. It's just, it makes no sense. I think I'm gonna put part one. Part one I think is gonna go... Part one I think is definitely goes like here, and then part two goes like... Goes like here. I'm having like a ridiculously hard time just trying to... Because again, I mean, that's the thing, like, in the in All Out War, right, we had the whole scare of Rick potentially being infected, too. Because we had the whole him getting shot with the, uh, with the coded arrow, right? Or bolt, I guess. Yeah, I, I don't really know how, like, how to, how to properly rank these. Because, I mean, obviously, this was, like, the big payoff, right? But this is, this is everything leading up to the big payoff, so... The one can't really exist without the other. You know what, I'm gonna leave it as is. I'm gonna leave it as is, um, and we'll move on. Volume 22. Volume 22 is our first, our first proper time skip in the comic, right? Because I mean, this was this was like a like a big deal. Um, did you care for Holly? Not really, no, not really. In the comic version, even more so than the TV version. In the comic book, I more so just cared for the core characters, uh, mostly because the story also revolved around them much more than in the uh, than in the show. In the show, they they fledged out a lot of the uh, B characters, too. Uh, volume 22, this is where a lot of stuff was being set up, right? But a lot of stuff was being set up here, but it's basically we find ourselves type volu uh, volume. There are a few tidbits about it that are sort of sort of a bit jank, right? Magna's groups uh, showing up, or Magna, or however you call her. That's a bit jank. That said... It, it was exciting. It was definitely exciting, especially like, oh boy, like the whole, I still remember reading the book for the first time and the whole thing about Rick um, cutting his hair because he was a celebrity and basically trying to hide was so good. It was just like, oh, hey, because I honestly don't really remember much from it, like in just terms of my knee jerk reaction in terms of its events. There was the whole fake out, right? Where we thought that Megna might be might be going against Alexandria because she like found out about Negan or whatever. There was a little bit of that spookiness, but aside from that, it was mostly just chill. You know what? I'm just I'm just going to put it bottom C for now. Volume 23, Whispers into Screams. For this one, I feel like context is super important, right? Cuz when you were reading the book, and the whole whispering thing popped up, there were so many different interpretations of what it could be. It wasn't really... Like, the whole whisperer's idea. It was... I mean, it was just that. It wasn't even an idea. I think the surprise factor... I don't know how TV crowds react to the whispers, right? And again, I remember it much better in the comic book because Rick was there. In the show, Rick wasn't even there, which is... 
something I'm still salty about. I really, really like the Whispers. I know a lot of people don't think that the Whispers like were, were a good group of baddies, but I really, really like them. Because it basically... For me, the Whispers were sort of a remix of something like... Something like Negan, but also Walkers, right? And we had overcome both. So the next logical step is both of them mixed, right? So we have these, these absolutely ruthless dudes who are basically hiding among walkers, and you can kill 15 walkers, but just one dude can sneak up behind you because you don't know which one of them is a person, right? And that concept was absolutely terrifying. God, I miss Rick for this stuff. 100%. It was, it was really, really bad. Um, where do I rank volume 23? If you can't tell, my rankings are getting more and more loose as we go. Um, because frankly, frankly, would I say that, would I say volume 17 is this much better than volume 2? No. <laughs> like, no. Alpha seems like a pretty good villain. Alpha, Alpha in the comic always seemed like a lot more cold. And again, I don't know how much of this is purely my own reading. Because in the, in the show, everything had a much different tone. Like, I don't know if this is just me, but after Rick disappeared from the show, everything in the show felt different. And I feel like the Whispers are a particularly strong example of that. Rick never plays a huge role in the book, but he's always there. And I feel like that is super important. So I'm going to stop rambling. I'm going to stop rambling and put the Whispers as, as top B for now. Uh, the show didn't do Alpha justice. I feel like I feel like the problem with Alpha in the show is that adapting something like the Whispers is just going to is just going to feel a bit a bit off either way, right? It, it is a super comic booky thing, and I feel like they they actually captured the tone of it very very well. I mean, the Pike scene is like the perfect example of that, right? I think the Pike scene was done incredibly well in the show. The only thing that I feel like the show missed is the whole Rick aspect of him being led to see the Horde. And then him coming back and seeing the pikes. Um, which is just unfortunate. I feel like she was more uh, inhumanely called in the comics. Very much so, yes. Volume 24. Life and Death. This is where the pike scene happens, right? This is where the whole Rick introduction happens. I mean, as I said, because Rick was Rick was the one to, to basically lead us into the whispers and all that. It was incredible, basically. I think having the leader... Because this was, again... I keep jumping around because my thoughts are all jumbled up now. Um, anyway, just like we saw with Negan, right? The important part was breaking Rick. And I feel like with Alpha, that was so, so explicit, right? She casually walked around with Rick, who was, at that point, an old man missing a hand and with a messed up leg, right? Rick was an absolute trooper. And she just casually leads him around, tells him like, hey look at my horde, and then when he asks about the border, she's like, you'll know when you see it, trust me. Like, that alone is insane. That is huge. Imagine if they killed off Ezekiel like they do in the comics. Um, Ezekiel in the comics, I feel like he's much less of a big character, if that makes sense. He is obviously a big deal in the comics too, right, because he's still the leader of the kingdom. Uh, but compared to the TV version, I feel like the TV version quite substantially expanded his character. All right, I think volume 24 is going to go above Made to Suffer. The Pike scene alone is, like, much worse than what the governor did in many ways. It's also not at the same time, but at the same time, it very much is. I would even put the Pike scene and everything leading up to it. You know what? Yes. Yes. The Whispers are going to shoot up. I love the Whispers. So volume 25, no turning back. This is basically, basically Rick coming to terms with everything that happened and essentially declaring another war, right? So a time skip, a time skip has happened, things do appear sort of chill and then boom, Pike scene, ha uh, Pike scene happens and Rick is thrown right to the forefront. Uh, there was the huge debate of what to do with Lydia. Yes, Lydia in the, in the show is so weird. Like her character is so bizarre. Um, I mean, I think the easy answer is just because there's no Carl, right? Again, I'm going to take the easy answer out and just say, it's Carl, right? There's no Carl, so Lydia's entire storyline is, is bizarre. Oh, you know what we didn't talk about? 
We didn't talk about Carl going ham on the bunch of kids with the brick. Remember the Sophia thing? Remember the Sophia thing? Carl took a brick. I think it was a brick. It, it was something along the ri uh, lines of, uh, of a brick. It was gnarly. Imagine if Carl in the show had done that. Imagine. Uh, I remember when the, the cover for this volume came out and everybody was just like, Oh boy. Oh boy, is Negan pulling the strings now? Like, what is going on? This volume is super hype. Uh, it's not, like, compared to the Pike, and it, like, I feel like it suffers because it's squeezed in between, like, the build-up and then the war, right? This one is sort of more low-key, and it's more so formal announcements, formal preparations, and all that. I do think that it is a really good volume, though. A tier, low A. Uh, I don't think it's even A tier, to be honest. I think for me, it's gonna be below... I think for me, it's gonna be here. Because, yeah, I mean, this one is is more so... We Wait, hold on. This is also the volume where Rick is attacked. Pretty sure this is the volume where Rick is attacked again. But, I mean, that didn't really amount to much. Following that, we move right into Calls to Arms. Or Call to Arms, rather. This was an incredibly hype point in the in the comic book for me. Uh, I don't know why, because I mean the, the survivors have always had a sort of a sort of a military, right? Obviously, it's never never like armed forces or whatever. But the concept of all of them training to use firearms and like this proper militia forming, and then we have like the whole silence, the whispers, that was so so cool. I absolutely loved that. It felt like we were sort of. Much of it was invalidated with the Commonwealth, uh, which we'll get to in a second. Um, I have some mixed feelings on that. But actually establishing establishing a military was super big, and I really, really like that. Uh, again, it's always been around, but making it official, it was fun. Uh, and the preparations for the Whisperer War, based on all the conflicts we had seen before, that was just incredibly hype, right? In terms of big events... Uh, is there, like, anything huge that happens? This is where Negan escapes, right? Because that leads us right into... Yeah, this is where Negan escapes. Where do I where do I put this? Th this is gonna be high, because I really, really like this volume. Right there. Right there. I feel like it's a little bit less exciting than the introduction of the Whispers themselves. But then... It kind of makes up for that with Negan's escape, because that's sort of the surprise factor of the volume. And considering what Negan would end up doing, that sort of also colors my my perception of it in retrospect. Because, oh man, we'll get to it in a second, of course. But what Negan gets up to in the Whisperer War, oh boy, that is ridiculous. Like, every single time I just look at this ranking, it's, it's so all over the place, frankly. Like, I could easily switch most of these around and it would still be perfectly fine. Anyway, let's wrap this up. Let's wrap this up. Um... Ish, uh, not issue, volume 27. So this is the Whisperer War. Unlike the, unlike the, uh, the uh, All Out War, this one is just one volume. And I still remember that when it was coming out, people were sort of saying that it should have been two volumes. Many people thought that the Whisperer War was, uh, relatively rushed. That said, the Whisperer War is incredibly, incredibly, incredibly hype. Uh, volume 27 and 28 had a lot more stuff in them uh, with small uh, images. Yeah, exactly. Uh, that's that's basically your... your Both in manga and in comic books, when the author is suddenly starting to use like those small frames, you know that they have a lot of story to tell, but that they just... They need to fill a volume, right? And they can't go past that. Um, and I feel like that was... That was a bit yikes. Negan's bat breaking over Beta's back... Oh boy. Oh boy. I won't lie, I wasn't a huge fan of uh, of Beta in the uh in the show. Much of that is just because Beta in the comics was like let's be real, he was ridiculous. The dude was a behemoth. Uh and in the show, I mean, yeah, the dude was big, but it's just in the comic book everybody was bigger, right? And it was just <laughs> it was just a ton of fun seeing these two two big dudes. I'm going to put it I'm gonna put it... No, you know what? I'm gonna put it right there. Or maybe right there. Because it was exciting, but I feel like a lot of... A lot of the big stuff... A lot of the big stuff that I want to talk about is in A Certain Doom. This, this is good. This is good. 
this is good. Because a lot of it, a lot of the important stuff that I want to talk about, actually comes in volume 28. And I will say it right now, this volume is incredible. I don't know what Kirkman was thinking. Because I still remember, this is the volume and these, these were the issues that had, like, his apology in them, uh, in them right? Volume 28 is S tier. Question is where in S tier does it fall? This is Andrea's death. I will I will never forget Andrea's death. Uh like this volume, this entire volume is just Andrea's death to me. That's what everything here is about. Uh Andrea's death overshadows everything going on. And because like this was super unfortunate, right? Cuz in the show, there was the whole with the whispers, right? There were the delays, I think. That was like around around the lockdowns, right? I feel, I, or was that was that after that? I seem to remember that the that the whisper release schedule was kind of weird in the show. This is one of those volumes that I kind of want to rank super high because of how emotionally impactful it was. Andrea's death shook up the story to its very 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 core. That is we we haven't really seen a death like that in the show, ever. Which is kind of crazy. Because everybody in the show that has been... That has been that important... Because Rick was... <laughs> Rick was medevaced, right? Michonne is somewhere. And then all the other OGs are either in their own spin-offs or they're just safe. I think... I'm gonna leave it... I'm gonna leave it here. I don't think it tops Negan's introduction for me personally. But in terms of... In terms of bringing the story back, yeah, them leading the walkers off the cliff, that was a, that was what I was about to say. Them bringing the story back into um into the whole zombies thing. That was that was like really really cool, right? I'm going to leave it here. I'm going to leave it here. And I feel like the whole whispers plan by the way was was much more exciting in the comic book. I still remember like them just using the horses and then just dumping them off a cliff. That was so cool. That was so cool. I mean, in the show, they kind of did that. I don't think it was that cool. I don't know why. Maybe because it's Rick. But honestly, at this point in the comic book, which is like something people tend to forget, at this point in the comic book, I could say what happens, and it wouldn't spoil anything, because none of the characters are the same. Literally, none of the characters are the same. Like, Andrea is not there, Rick is not there, Carl is not there, and Sophie is not there. Those are like the big four that just don't match, right? And they basically figure into everything. Uh, volume 29, Lines We Cross. This is where the, where the Negan-Dwight confrontation happens, right? So this is basically where Negan scares them straight, and then he leaves. Negan-Dwight happened in 28. Oh, okay, so that's even more brownie points for, for this. Yeah, I feel like at this point in the story, uh, this is basically where, the reason why I think a lot of people were burned, right? This is where Kirkman started setting up these these plot lines, right? Because Negan goes off, we go over to the Commonwealth, then there's like drama brewing within Alexandria, and like we have a lot of these plot lines sort of starting, but then, of course, we all know where that leads. It leads nowhere, right? And years back, Kirkman had said he has the story planned out to issue 200, and then he said the story would lead into issue 300, which never did, right? And I feel like that is what has soured many people, including me, especially in retrospect, right? Because a lot of stuff starts here, but I mean, look at this. Commonwealth starts here, Walking Dead ends here. You know, like, this just, it's a bit... I'm pretty sure it, it was volume 29 where, where Negan goes to find Lucille, right? Where he finds her and buries her. I think that's volume 29. But whatever. Volume 29 is not a favorite of mine. I'll say it right now. Volume 29 very much felt like a setup volume. Um, unlike most people, I don't think the princess was that weird, frankly. We have a lot of weird characters in the comic book, uh, and the princess is not the weirdest one. Uh, her outfit is a bit all over the place, but in terms of personality, I do not think she's the weirdest one by a long stretch. I'm gonna put it bottom C, honestly. Best moment is Maggie and Negan? Probably, yeah. That's probably the highlight of this one. This is basically where Negan's story in the comic book is wrapped up, right? This is basically where all that ends. Unlike in the show, where he's getting a spin-off. <laughs> um, there was the one shot about Negan, though. Moving into New World Order. I have, I have to sort of... 
I have to detach my emotional brain from my critical brain. Because my emotional brain is very, very sad. Because when, when the Commonwealth was introduced and we saw the Stormtroopers and there was this like whole New World Order thing. First of all, Kirkman promised 300 issues. I was, I was expecting 300 issues. I was expecting, I was expecting to read The Walking Dead for 15 more years, right? And I would have been happy. I would have read every issue and I would have been happy. But when we got into, into the Commonwealth, I was of two minds. Number one, it does undermine a lot of what we've seen so far. Because with the Commonwealth, it was basically a shortcut from Alexandria starting a civilization to a civilization. There was no in-between, right? They sort of developed the fundamentals. They were self-sustaining. They sort of produced weapons, etc., etc. Um, obviously, the Commonwealth eclipsed them in basically every sense of the word. They were bigger, they had better weaponry, they had better tech. I mean, it was literally a city, right? So I feel like that was a shortcut, which undermines a lot of what we'd seen so far. And on top of that, the Commonwealth, in a way that we hadn't seen before, it invalidates so much of what we knew, right? Zombies in the Commonwealth? No. Doesn't make sense. 50,000 people. Literal stormtroopers, right? Yeah, I don't, I don't know how much of this is just me being salty that the series ended. If something has to go F tier, right? I mean, something has to go F tier. This is ridiculous. This tier list is ridiculous. Um, you know what? Why not? I'm gonna I'm gonna put New World Order in it. Nah, I don't want to. I'm, I don't want to put it F tier. I'm gonna put it bottom. No, actually, I like it more. I'm gonna put it there. Cause like, don't get me wrong. Uh, the introduction was exciting. Problem is, it never really led anywhere. Uh. Speaking of which, speaking of which, volume 31, The Rotten Core, right? So this is, this is a very, very different one in terms of basically every, everything, right? In terms of narrative beats, this basically became like a political drama at this point. Rick showed up, realized that what they're doing is they like have this whole classist structure, right? So while Rick and the others were essentially liberated from, um from like the constructs of society, they come in here and they're like right back and they're even worse. So it's basically all about that. We've seen some of that in the show, but I feel like one thing that the show still hasn't done, uh, I actually saw that apparently we're finally getting, imagine, imagine we're going, uh, we're going to get an establishing shot for, uh, for the Commonwealth. We're finally going to see what it actually is, which is great. I feel like in the show, the Commonwealth the size of the Commonwealth is just not there. You do not feel like it's 50,000 people. In the, sh uh, in the comic, though, obviously, that was much, much easier. So in terms, of, in terms of shaking up the story, it was really, really cool. But at the same time, again, it undermined a lot of, what, a lot of the story in my, uh, in my mind. And, uh, I don't know. Like, Dwight's death was honestly really bad. Didn't matter for what Rick was trying to do. I think the Dwight death was actually pretty good. I was kind of, I was, I was still, I was still really, really interested in seeing what's gonna happen, right? It was sort of anything goes, right? Because this was completely uncharted territory. These were not walkers. These were not necessarily human threats. They were human threats, but they weren't human threats in the sense of someone like Negan, right? It was more so an ideology that had to change. And Rick was obviously the right person to change it. Yeah, I'm going in circles. I'm, I'm gonna put the Rotten Core above above this, right? Because the setup was done. Actually, I'm even gonna put it above the... Uh, no, I'm not. Seeing the time skip was more exciting. And then moving on to the very, very last volume. Uh, I think as with... As with any person, my feelings on the last volume are very mixed. Clearly, it is very, very rushed. Like, let's be real. It is incredibly rushed. And to the person who asked... I don't remember who it was... Somebody asked, is Rick gone? Like, is Rick just helicoptered off? No, he gets shot in his sleep. And dies. And then Carl finds the zombified Rick. And then we get the scene which I very much think was a fourth wall break. There's the panel of Carl just saying, I can't go on without you. Right? And then we time skip. And then the series is over. Do I think it is a good ending? I do think it is a good ending. I genuinely do. Problem is, we never got... The between, right? In terms of the ending, 
I think it is exactly what many of us were expecting. The Old Man Carl ending was one that people had been talking about for years. And it was exactly that. It was Carl telling the story of his father, right? That's perfect. If, it, if that's not a perfect bow tie on the story of The Walking Dead, then I don't know what is. Could you have done Everybody Dies? Sure. But that's not the reason why we were following Rick. In many ways, Rick rest uh, restarted civilization, and that's basically what the story was about. As for, as for the volume itself, because I wouldn't say the volume is bad. I would say the volume is bad in the bigger story. She's <laughs> got the most stupid joke idea ever. You know what? I'm gonna put this in F tier, but this is an F tier. You know what this is? This is pre uh, this is press F to pay respects. Drop your Fs in the chat. Fs for The Walking Dead and F for Rick. Drop your Fs in the chat. This is not F tier. This is not F tier. This is F for The Walking Dead. There we go. There we go. There we go. I definitely had this plan the entire time. Definitely. I opened the stream and I knew I was going to do that. I didn't just I didn't just come up with it. But yeah, genuinely like, reading the comic book for the first time, and the story just ending, it was... It was really, really, really rough. Right? Because it genuinely came out of the blue. That, that's where I'm gonna leave it. It's gonna be... It's gonna be F to pay respect. Uh, the thing with this tier list, and now if you are watching on YouTube, let me explain. Let me explain. Around halfway through this tier list, I realized that the margin of difference between like volume 17 and like volume 29 is not that big at all. Kirkman obviously planned these volumes to be builders and then you have something exciting, right? And each volume follows this trend. And so broadly speaking, all the volumes are really, really, really good. It's not like The Walking Dead where there's like, a, uh, like The Walking Dead, like the TV series, where there's like the clear outlier of season seven messing up big time. With the volumes, I feel like they're much more at an even level all the way through. So yeah, basically, this tier list, I mean, it was fun, but would I say it is totally representative? Probably not. <laughs> Gonna be honest. Hello, this is Editing Kroto jumping in. I know people are gonna ask, so F jokes aside, I would probably put volume 32 somewhere in S tier. I know it's controversial, but again, in terms of an ending, it is basically exactly what most of us were expecting. Yes, it was rushed, but that is more so the meta factor. And if I'm talking about just the volume itself and the story it tells, I do have to say that, for me personally at least, it does deliver. It is a beautiful ending to the story of Rick, and as much as I would have wanted to see more of it, well, that's what it is. I will, of course, or maybe already have, talked about it a lot more in the retrospective, so just keep an eye out for that. That is all for me, and I will see you all sometime tomorrow or the day after that, or I don't know when. All right, have a good one. Bye-bye.